Chapter 15, Thermodynamics. Here's a small sample of some key terms and concepts associated with thermodynamics. You can see the range. On one hand, we have air conditioners, car engines, refrigerators, and motorcycle engines. On the other end, you see terms like the arrow of time, creationism versus evolution, entropy, and the heat death of the universe. The word thermodynamics. Thermo means heat, dynamics means motion. So thermodynamics is the study of what happens when heat is in motion. There's a lot of really interesting applications and revelations, and thermodynamics is absolutely one of the key fundamental foundations of physics. The first law of thermodynamics. It's basically a statement of the law of conservation of energy. The term internal energy was introduced and explained in the previous chapter. Imagine a glass of water and take a really close look at the water molecules and notice at the microscopic level all the different kinds of potential energy and kinetic energy they possess. They have translational kinetic energy, they have rotational kinetic energy, they have gravitational potential energy, and electrostatic potential energy. All of those energies are collectively known as internal energy. Every object has internal energy. A glass of water, a brick, the gas-air mixture that's injected into your cylinder in your car engine. Capital letter U is used to represent internal energy. We need to feel comfortable with two terms, surroundings and system. Here are two examples. On the left, you see a system absorbing heat and doing work. On the right, you have a system absorbing heat and work is being done on that system. There is a difference between work done by a system versus work done on a system. Let's look at the left box. Consider an automotive engine, for example. You feed an automotive engine heat. That heat comes from the explosion of a gas-air mixture. The work it does is to push a piston, and that piston is connected via various linkages to the wheels on the automobile, which makes it move. That's where the work happens. For the box on the right, let's think of a balloon. Imagine taking a balloon from the inside of your air-conditioned house to the outside on a really hot August day. Heat is going to flow into the balloon and you would expect the balloon to expand, but what if you took the balloon and you squeezed it so you compressed it? That would be an example of heat flowing into the system, the system in this case is a balloon, and work being done on the system. If I'm squeezing that balloon to decrease its volume, I am doing work on that balloon. If the balloon was left alone and heat was flowing into it, the balloon would expand and, and that would be a case of the balloon doing work on its surroundings. We have to be really careful about how to designate positive work versus negative work and positive heat versus negative heat. If heat flows into the system, we count it as positive. If heat flows out of the system, it gets counted as negative. Work done by the system is considered positive and work done on the system is negative. Here's the expression for the first law. It's saying the change in internal energy depends on the amount of heat flowing in or out of the system and the amount of work done on the system or by the system. Look at the box on the left. Heat is flowing into the system, so the system's internal energy would tend to increase. On the other hand, the system is doing work on the surroundings, so that would decrease the system's internal energy. The net change in the system's internal energy depends specifically on the amount of heat flowing in and the amount of work being done by the system. Look at the box on the right. The heat flowing into the system would tend to increase the system's internal energy and and if the surroundings are doing work on the system, that would also increase the system's internal energy. In this case, both the heat and the work would drive up the system's internal energy. The net change would be an increase in internal energy. As far as exploiting thermodynamics for the benefit of humankind, the goal is to figure out how to get heat flow to do work for us as it's flowing. From a graphical perspective, if you plot pressure versus volume and look at this area, under the pressure versus volume curve, that represents the amount of heat done during that process. So the goal is to get the largest possible shaded area on a pressure versus volume graph. Let's run through some basic thermodynamic processes, starting with isobaric. Iso means same or unchanged. Baric refers to pressure, so this is a constant pressure process. This is a good visual. I have a cylinder with a 
movable piston, there's a load placed on that piston that looks like a brick, and I'm subjecting that system to a heat source which causes heat or Q to flow into the system. Because that piston is allowed to move and it's exposed to the atmospheric pressure or ambient pressure at all times, the piston will move in whatever way it needs to move to maintain constant pressure inside. So that's why you see on my pressure versus volume diagram or PV diagram a flat line for my pressure value. The volume is increasing but my pressure remains the same. So this rectangular shaded area corresponds to the amount of work done during this process. Again, isobaric refers to a constant pressure process and the work done is equal to the pressure which remains constant times the change in volume. Number two, an isochoric or sometimes known as an isovolumetric process. Iso means same or unchanged. Cork refers to volume. So this is referred to as isochoric or again as an isovolumetric process. I have a similar looking system except this time there's no movable piston. If I add heat, all of that heat goes into increasing my internal energy. No work is done because nothing can get pushed around. For an isobaric process, I could push that brick up or the brick could push down on the system. In the case of an isovolumetric process, heat can flow and internal energy can change, but no work happens. That's why the PV diagram shows that the volume remains constant, but the pressure can change. In this case, if I add heat, the pressure is going to increase, but no work is occurring. There is no area under this graph. So again, an isochoric or isovolumetric process refers to a process that occurs with no change in volume and no work done on the system or by the system. Number three, isothermal process. Iso means same. Thermal refers to heat. So isothermal means the process is occurring at a constant temperature. How could this be accomplished? Check out the visual. I take my cylinder with movable piston and I put it in a tank of hot water. Heat is going to flow into my system which will cause the piston to rise, you would think that things would start to cool down. But because my cylinder is immersed in a thermal reservoir, as soon as the system tries to cool down, heat from the reservoir will flow in to maintain a constant temperature. Imagine the same system and I push down on that movable piston. You would expect things to get really hot. But instead of getting really hot, all of the built up heat that would form is absorbed by the reservoir. In this case, the reservoir reservoir is the tank of water. So the reservoir gives heat or takes heat in order to maintain a constant temperature and that assumes that heat can flow from the system to the surroundings which in this case it can. Isothermal means a process that happens at a constant temperature. In this case the PV diagram shows a system starting at a small volume but a pretty high pressure changing to a high volume but a pretty low pressure. That corresponds to the piston moving from the bottom to the top in this visual. That line that connects the initial pressure volume state to the final pressure volume state is called an isotherm. Any point along that isotherm represents different pressure and volume values, but the temperature is going to be the same everywhere. The amount of work done corresponds to the area under this curve and this is the mathematical expression that gives you the numerical value. Number four, the adiabatic process. An adiabatic process happens with no heat flow into or out of the system. Here's my same piston with movable cylinder. Instead of being located in a thermal reservoir, it's perfectly insulated. So if I lift that piston from the lower to higher position, the system will cool down. That's called expansion cooling. And because there's no reservoir to feed it heat to maintain its temperature, it does in fact cool down. This line is called an adiabatic curve, or sometimes it's just referred to as an adiabat. The area under this curve represents the work done during this process. And here Here's an analytical expression for the change in internal energy that occurs during an adiabatic process. When we were talking about solids and liquids, we used specific heat capacity to keep track about the heat flowing into or out of a system and how its temperature changed. When we're analyzing a gas, we typically work with these expressions. This is referred to the molar specific heat capacity 
at constant pressure. This is referred to molar specific heat capacity at constant volume. So you do have to be aware of the type of process you're working with. For an isobaric process, you would use this expression, the molar specific heat capacity at a constant pressure. For an isochoric, also known as isovolumetric process, you would use this expression, the molar specific heat capacity at constant volume. If you're looking at an adiabatic process, Q always equals zero. If you're looking at an isothermal process, there is no change in temperature, so delta T equals zero. If there's no change in temperature, there's no change in internal energy, because internal energy is also basically a measure of the system's temperature. So if delta U equals zero and delta U equals Q minus W, then we get Q equals W for an isothermal process. Here's the key to this C subscript P and C subscript V terms. Just like when we were talking about liquids and solids and used Q equals MC delta T, C in this case, lowercase c, was referring to specific heat capacity of the given liquid or solid. In this case, Q equals NCP delta T or Q equals NCV delta T. CP refers to the molar specific heat capacity at constant pressure and CV refers to the molar specific heat capacity at constant volume. And here's what they're equal to. Remember, R is called the universal gas law constant and has a value of 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. Here are four ways to think about the second law of thermodynamics, which is in the hall of fame of most important laws of physics. We're going to use the capital letter S to, to signify entropy. So delta S refers to the change in entropy. It turns out entropy is a one-way street. It's the arrow of time. Entropy always increases. It never decreases. In some case, it can break even in a localized system. But overall, from a universal scale, entropy always increases. It's not conserved. It's, it is, again, a one-way street. The Clausius statement says it's not possible to heat to spontaneously flow from a cold region to a warmer region. Heat will always naturally flow from hot to cold unless, like in the case of a refrigerator, you do work to force heat to flow from cold to hot, like from your already cold freezer to your already hot kitchen. The Kelvin-Planck statement says it's impossible to take heat from a hot reservoir and use it all to do work. Some amount of that input heat has to be exhausted as waste heat. In other words, there's no perfect heat engine. A lot of times you see on YouTube, for example, claims of a perpetual energy device or a free energy device, meaning that you can somehow get a device that does work without needing to be fed any type of heat energy. Those are never possible because they always violate the second law of thermodynamics, which, which from the Kelvin Planck point of view says that all engines have to spit out some amount of waste heat. Nature says it is impossible to have a 100% efficient heat engine. The Carnot principle says that the difference in temperature is directly related to efficiency. Engines like to work between a really hot reservoir and a really cold reservoir. So automobile engines are pretty efficient because the temperature of the exploding gas air mixture in the cylinder is very high and the temperature of the outside air which is the other reservoir is pretty low. So that's a pretty big delta T. A jet engine enjoys an even greater delta T. Jet fuel being combusted in a jet engine occurs at a much higher temperature than the surrounding air, which is quite a bit cooler up at higher altitudes. So you have a bigger delta T, bigger efficiency. Next section, heat engines. We're going to draw heat engines to look like this. Look at this visual. It's basically a circle with three lines connected to it. In this case, you're looking at a heat engine. Why do I know that? Because heat is flowing into the engine and work energy and waste heat come out of the engine. That's what engines do. They consume heat and they produce work and they spit out waste heat. It's pretty apparent from the visual. QH equals W plus QC. QH, look at my visual, is the heat going in. What goes in must come out somehow. And in this case, the heat energy going in is coming out in the form of work 
plus the waste heat. Efficiency is in general what you want over how you pay for it. In the case of a heat engine, I want the engine to do work. How do I pay for that work? I pay for it with heat, input heat, Q sub H. Carnot engines are the theoretically most perfect engine one can ever hope to build. It's assuming there are no losses. There are no air resistance losses, no kinetic friction losses, no drag losses, no losses, period. It means I could complete one cycle without losing any wasted energy due to friction or air resistance, etc. That's what the term reversible refers to. A reversible process is one in which both the system and its environment can be returned to exactly the same states they were in before the process occurred. No real engine is as efficient as a Carnot engine. A Carnot engine is the theoretical perfect engine. It's used as a limiting factor. If I'm dealing with two heat reservoirs, again, a source of really high temperature heat and some exhaust area. Carnot tells me what the most perfectly efficient engine could be between those two temperature extremes, and I know that any real engine I build is going to be less efficient. This Carnot ratio is basically saying that the ratio of my exhaust heat's temperature to the input heat's temperature is equal to the exhaust temperature itself to the input temperature itself. QC refers to cold heat, and that might seem like a, an odd term, but it's basically referring to the temperature at which the heat is exhausted at. So the heat coming out of the tailpipe of your car is at a lower temperature than the heat going into your engine as a result of the exploding gas air mixture. So we do use those terms hot heat versus cold heat. The temperature of the reservoir into which the cold heat is being exhausted is referred to as the cold temperature and the temperature of the hot reservoir from which the heat is being derived is the hot temperature. This expression here can be used if and only if you're talking about a Carnot engine. I could use this expression for any engine. This expression is applicable for a Carnot engine and non-Carnot engines, but this expression here can only be applied to a Carnot. Refrigerators are heat engines in reverse. Look at the arrows in this picture. I am doing work on a refrigerator. Why? Because I want my refrigerator to take heat from an already cold reservoir and pump it out to an already warmer environment. That is not natural. That would not happen naturally. So the only way I can make this occur is if I am willing to spend energy in the form of heat to do so. This is why a refrigerator takes cold heat from your freezer and dumps it to an already warm kitchen. Same with an air conditioner. An air conditioner takes heat from your already cool living room and can dump it out to an outdoor environment that's sitting there at 95 degrees. For refrigerators and air conditioners, we use this expression for efficiency. It's COP, coefficient of performance. Again, efficiency is always what you want versus how you pay for it. In the case of a refrigerator or an air conditioner, what do I want? I want heat to be removed from the already cold reservoir. How do I pay for it? I pay for it with work. A heat pump is a device you can buy that somehow takes heat from a cold winter's day and pumps it into your house to keep your home warm. Now, in reality, reality, there are two streams of energy that are being dumped into your house during a winter day. The first stream is the already cold heat energy that exists outdoors, and the second is the heat that comes from the work you do to pull that heat in from the outdoors. Last section, entropy. Again, we represent entropy with the letter capital S. Here's how we're going to define entropy here. Entropy is defined as the amount of heat that flows from one region to another region and the temperature at which it flows. A lot of people think of entropy as the measure of disorder of a system, which is fine. You can think of it from a statistical point of view, which we won't really get into in this course. But it's safe to think of entropy as a measure of disorder of a system and analytically given by this expression. And the one other noteworthy bullet is entropy entropy always increases, it never decreases, it never really stays the same from the point of view of the universe writ large. Let's look at the entropy for a Carnot engine cycle. You might say to yourself, well, heat is leaving the hot reservoir. So according to my expression, if heat is leaving my hot reservoir, entropy actually decreases. It's like if you take a cup of hot water and put it in a freezer, if it freezes, that frozen water actually has more order, meaning less entropy 
recipe than the cup of hot water. The cup of hot water has a bunch of violently moving around water molecules going crazy, and the ice, everything is sitting in a rigid crystalline structure. The Carnot engine does spit out some waste heat, as all engines have to do. So the region where the Carnot engine is spitting its waste heat shows an increase in entropy. So in the case of a Carnot engine, after one cycle, the change in entropy is equal to zero. I have a decrease in entropy for the hot reservoir. I have an increase in entropy for the cold reservoir. The overall net effect is no change in entropy. And you might be asking yourself, that's impossible. That's a violation of the second law of thermodynamics. And you would be right. The Carnot engine does not exist in nature, but it is a very interesting target to always keep in mind when you're looking at what might be possible in the best possible scenario. Everything you do increases entropy. You might say to yourself, I'm going to go home and clean up my bedroom and therefore decrease the entropy of the universe because a messy bedroom represents a high degree of disorder, but a well-organized bedroom represents a decrease in disorder. But here's the catch. The energy you used in straightening up your bedroom more than compensates for the decrease in entropy. Overall, you have just increased the universe's entropy by attempting to straighten up your bedroom. So why bother?